Hey, and welcome to the lecture. Before we jump into the learning, just a quick reminder to check out the workbooks available on modernoptician.com through the Ultimate Apprentice Optician Study Guide or available on Amazon worldwide. It's the best way to accompany this lecture so that you can fill in the blanks, label the diagrams, do everything all concurrently and elevate your training to the next level. All the links to the workbooks and the website are all in the description down below, so make sure to check it out. Other than that, enjoy today's lesson. All right, here we go. Iris and pupil. We've started anteriorly at the cornea and moved our way towards the center of the eye. And now we're today we're going to look at the iris and pupil. Two structures extremely important to vision and a few other things too that we're going to discuss uh, in a little bit more detail in a second here. Uh, interestingly, remember that the iris is the actual structure. The pupil is just the hole in the center. Uh, and But they are completely linked. You can't have one without the other. And it is something that we have to uh, always recognize. Uh, and it's funny because we talk a lot about pupillary reactions. We talk about pupil size. Where is the pupil when we're fitting things? We never give the iris much love. And um, I think that's just because at the end of the day, it is the opening of the iris that we're most concerned about. But maybe we should start giving that iris a little bit more love because uh, it's been in the background for so long. So let's take a look at a few things about what we need to know as opticians about the iris and pupil. So first, just like we've been doing for some time, let's pull up the cross section of the eye and just look at the location. So highlighted in green here is the iris. Uh, and of course, at the center is the pupil. And yes, it is just a hole. It is not actually a structure. Uh, but once again, they go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. Now, the iris itself is composed of thin, circular and radial muscles which control the size of the pupil and thus the amount of light entering the eye. And this is basically the entire purpose of the iris here is to control how much light enters the eye. We talked about already how the whole purpose to the, or the whole concept of vision hinges on light entering the eye being converged at, to a certain point. And this is essentially just like a camera, the aperture where you can alter the amount of light depending on lighting conditions that is entering the eye. Now, the eye, outer layer of the corn, uh, sorry, of the iris uh, is called the stroma, and it's a highly pigmented layer responsible for the iris's color. Uh, Darker eyes have more pigment, lighter eyes have less pigment. So it's just a concept. The the color of the eye here is not factoring in to what we do every day as far as vision and vision correction. However, in some cases, uh, higher pigmented eyes could be prone to certain problems, whereas lighter pigmented eyes can be prone to others as well. Things that we'll discuss a little bit more when we talk about ocular pathology. However, for the time being, let's just focus on the mechanisms of how these two structures kind of work together. So here we have pictures of irises straight on. <clears throat> so the pupil, the center, right, is constricted by the sphincter pupillae and dilated by the dilator pupillae muscles. Two muscles working hand in hand together in order to achieve the ultimate effect, to open and close the pupil opening. All right, so constriction and dilation of the pupil is more accurately called the pupillary reflex. Why do we call it the pupillary reflex? Because if I open and close my hand, my fingers, all the muscles in my hand, those are voluntary muscle contractions. I think that I want to close my hand, therefore I do. The pupillary reflex is completely uh, subconscious. It is not a voluntary response. It's an involuntary muscle contraction. It is based, the, your brain activates these muscles based on lighting conditions you cannot contract and, and constrict the pupil by thinking about it. So remember, this is a reflex. It's a neurological process. So when the pupil constricts, the sphincter muscle, the, sorry, the sphincter muscles contract, and this happens in bright light. As soon as you enter a room with bright light, these muscles contract, making the pupil opening smaller and constricting that opening. <clears throat> Now, if both muscles are relaxed that, you know, in normal light, they don't actually have to work too hard. And in ambient lighting and normal things, when it's not too bright, both muscles tend to be pretty relaxed. However, in dark conditions, in dim light, the dilator muscle kicks in 
and contracts so that the pupil opening gets larger. Okay, and this is an important concept that we have to remember as opticians because vision is very dependent on lighting conditions for a couple of different reasons, which we'll go over in a second here. So just a little bit of background, normal pupil sizes ranges from two to four millimeters in the light and about four to eight so sorry, four to nine millimeters in the dark. Okay, so there's a little bit of a variance here depending on the lighting conditions. And the sphincter pupillae is controlled by the parasympathetic nervous system while the sympathetic pathway controls the dilar pupillae. And this might seem like a lot of information here for you. And it's not things, we're just giving you background here. It's not things that you necessarily are going to encounter every single day. But the reason I've mentioned this is as follows. When we talk about pupillary reactions, especially in the ophthalmology side of things, there is a huge link between how the pupil behaves and the brain. So you'll, if you watch shows like ER or Grey's Anatomy or any kind of you know, TV doctor show, you'll notice that they're often checking pupillary reflexes. The reason for this is that the pupillary reflex will give you a great indication of whether or not there is some kind of head injury because it tests both the parasympathetic and the sympathetic pathways. Um, and it's a, it's a marker of whether or not those things are operating properly. So it's one of those things that even though we're not doing this every day, but many opticians branch out into ophthalmology and it's something that we check all the time in ophthalmology to make sure that everything's working well with that reflex. And if it's not, then we have to suspect that there could be some neurological damage or neurological problems. So very, very important to keep that in mind. Um, and the anisocoria, I'm not the anisocoria, but the term anisocoria is a, is a relatively common abnormality where one pupil opening is larger than the other. Why are we mentioning this? Because you may encounter this. And if you see anisocoria and the person's always had anisocoria, it is not a huge deal. Um, however, sudden onset of anisocoria has to make you wonder if there's some kind of neurological issue. So we talk about this as opticians, first line defense in eye care. If you have a patient that wakes up one morning and with this issue and comes to see you, you should be referring. It could be nothing. However, there's got to be a reason and there's not a lot of benign reasons why this goes on. Sometimes it can be serious. So it is definitely important that if you see anisocoria, especially if the patient says this has never been an issue and I woke up and one pupil is huge and the other one's small, you should be referring that person so they can be assessed a little bit further. Okay. Um, and now keep in mind too that I wanted to mention that the size of the pupil here has a huge impact in vision. We're going to go over this a little bit more when we talk about the actual visual pathway. However, the reason that the pupil constricts is for better vision. The the eyes, you know, we talked about how the cornea is, is highly responsible for refracting light. The center of the cornea is the best area for vision. It's usually free of refractive error, which we will talk about more in detail, and it gives you the best chance at vision. When the pupil is small, it's centering light over that best part of the retina. When the pupil is large, you are more prone to aberration, you're more prone to the effects of any kind of refractive air present, and therefore vision is poorer. Uh, this is one of the reasons why people often have a difficult time driving at night, uh, because when the pupil automatically enlarges in order to let more light in, it is more exposed to the aberrations of not only the cornea and the refractive elements of the eye, but sometimes even the lenses that we put in front of them. So even though we don't necessarily test pupillary uh, reactions in the dispensary and we talk about the pupil all the time, it plays. Because if you're noticing people with very large pupils and they're having a hard time with the lenses you're giving them and things like that, you have to start wondering if they're experiencing aberration from this pupil size. So always be thinking, I've mentioned this from the beginning, even though we're dealing with products and we're dealing with tangible things in front of us when we're dispensing glasses to people and, and troubleshooting and discussing all their visual needs, you should always be thinking anatomy and seeing how this how this relates to the products that you're offering them. All right. So as always, let's talk about the significance that of the pupil and the iris to us as opticians. We talked about the pupillary reflex versus vision. We talked about how dim light dilates the pupil and increases aberration. Um, I want you to remember that. This is not discussed very often in a lot of uh, opticianry courses, but it really plays because a large pupil is going to be a problem a lot of the time. And sometimes it's just something that a person has to deal with. As a matter of fact, in 
refractive surgery, for example, you know, LASIK and PRK and all the things, you know, laser surgery to uh, to assist with vision to correct refractive error. Pupil size is a huge determining factor on whether or not the person is a suitable candidate. People with large pupils, some people have resting pupil sizes of eight millimeters or larger. That sometimes eliminates them as candidates because the doctor knows that if they perform surgery here, that it could actually create aberrations that the person will not be able to get away from. And some and 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 in LASIK, um, satisfaction is a, a very important factor. People need to be happy with the final result because it's permanent, and often pupil size will eliminate them. And we talked about pupillary reflex versus trauma. Uh, not that we are nef definitely trauma experts. However, if there is no reflex or if there's anisocoria, we have to start wondering, is there some kind of brain injury? If it's sudden onset, we absolutely should be referring because that person needs to be assessed to see what the problem is. In ophthalmology and especially in the, um, the, you know, the assessment stage, Thing, an area where a lot of opticians work, uh, we talk about Perla and we do we do little tests with a flashlight to check if the pupils with the P, so I'll go through this acronym, the pupils are equal, round, reactive to light and accommodation. So that, that tests all the neurological pathways that are related to the pupil. Um, very, very commonly done. And, and this is a routine part of the screening test because it's very important to make sure that that part of the eye, the iris and the pupil are functioning properly. Otherwise, not only will vision suffer, but we could be uncovering some neurological issues that it have, absolutely have to be assessed. Another thing that we did not talk about, which is going to be discussed, which is gonna happen around you all the time, especially if you work side by side with a, a doctor, is that we often dilate the pupil during exam. Why is that? Well, if you think about it, we in the eye exam, it's a series of tests with lights and different things. And often, what, what happens, when, well, not often, all the time, when you shine a light onto the eye, what happens? The pupil constricts. It can be very difficult for the doctor to assess the retina which is at the back of the eye, when they have to look through a little pinhole, right? So one of the things that are done quite frequently is dilation during the exam. You're going to hear this all the time. Patient goes in, the exam lasts longer because they go in, they see the doctor, they instill drops, they wait about half an hour and they come back. And this essentially is a mydriatic medication. So you're going to hear drops like atropine, cyclopentylate, tropicamide, uh, and there's a lot of different brand names and things like that that kind of that, that do the same thing. But this drop will essentially um, stun, not stun, but paralyze the muscles that open up the, that, sorry, that constrict the pupil so that everything opens up. Okay. And it gives them an opportunity to look at the retina and to, to study it. Uh, while it's wide open and they had the best view. And these things usually wear off within you know, an hour or two, um, but the patients don't usually see very well. And like I mentioned, it relaxes the sphincter muscle and it dilates the pupil, right? So uh, one other thing that it also does that we didn't go into detail because we haven't talked in detail about accommodation is that it also relaxes the ciliary muscle and disables accommodation. So whenever, and again, we're gonna talk about this in more detail when we get to the, that point. However, just something to keep in mind, um, that this happens every day in the dispensary. When a patient has been dilated, it has that dual effect, right? It opens up the pupil and it also it disables accommodation. Um, when they come into the dispensary and start talking to you and looking for glasses, it can be quite cumbersome and difficult. Number one, the pupil is wide open, so they can be very sensitive to light because it'll make everything feel uncomfortable because of that brightness. Uh, they're also getting a heck of a lot more aberration because that pupil is wide open and they can't see anything up close because um, the accommodative reflex is what changes the focus of the eye and allows us to see up close. So it's kind of like a triple whammy here that they are not able to see very well after uh, the exam and until these accommodative, sorry, after these mydriatic drops have worn off. Um, sometimes they won't want to kind of deal with you at that point. They won't want to look at glass and stuff like that. And you have to understand because it's not the most comfortable thing. And from a standpoint of a, of a business, um, making decisions when you're, when you're, you know, 
when your your vision has been disabled like that is probably not the best idea because sometimes you can have problems where they don't remember what they've picked or they, they didn't really see what they picked all that well. Um, again, these are things we're going to talk about in more detail. However, for the time being, I think we have a bit of a better understanding of how the iris and pupil relate and how they work. And again, like I'm going to keep mentioning, you are now a little bit better at this than you were yesterday or earlier because you know a little bit more about the iris and pupil. So we'll move on and we'll move on to the next part of the eye.